Hello again, and welcome to the Barbara H. Smith Show. I am your host, and I am so excited to be here today with you. You know, it is a wonderful time to be alive with all of the information technology we have available to us, and I have some new information I want to share with you. Unleash the Speaker Within is a mastermind class that I am doing, and I want you to show up 8 a.m. on Tuesday, next Tuesday, so that you get a sneak peek of what Barbara H. Smith is working on. That's 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Unleash the Speaker Within. If you are trying to level up your speaking, if you are in front of audiences that you're trying to engage, that you're trying to motivate, that you're trying to encourage, you don't want to miss the premiere of Unleash the Speaker Within right here with me. I'm Barbara H. Smith, and I am your hostess for today. I'm so excited. We have a wonderful show, as always. But today, we have a phenomenal speaker. She has been a champion on and off the court for more than 30 years, a former Procter and & Gamble and beauty sales executive. She built Fran Harris Enterprises, LLC. So you guessed it, it's Fran Harris. It's a formidable training, coaching, consulting company with all kinds of clients from 70 Fortune 100 companies, top universities, startups, organizations in over 10 countries. She is amazing. Since 1995, she's authored not five, not 10, but 15 books. And she's taught business and marketing online. She is a former ESPN and Fox Sports announcer, HGTV host, a speaker at in firms in in the UK, France, business and marketing and thought leadership is known worldwide. She's landed television shows on almost every major network. Of course, NBC, CNBC, CNN, Fox Business, TLC, Comedy Central. She's got a quite a sense of humor, by the way. And she's led the University of Texas to its first and only NCAA championship with a 34 and 0 record. I don't want to prolong this lady coming to the platform. I want to introduce you to Fran Harris. Did you know that you could turn your knowledge, expertise, or experiences into a five, six, or even seven figure revenue stream in the next 12 months? It's true. Hey, I'm Fran Harris. And over the past 20 years, I've taught speakers, coaches, trainers, and consultants how to monetize their expertise and sell high ticket programs by investing fewer than 10 hours a week, or in some cases, not even quitting their day job. My students and I have also been featured in local and national media, such as Good Morning America, The Today Show, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, and even Shark Tank. Yes even Shark Tank. Hello, Sharks. I'm Fran Harris from Dallas, Texas. Oh. Yeah! <laughs> and now it's your turn. If you want to learn how to turn what you know into dough, schedule a free, no obligation blueprint call with me today. And just so you know, this free offer is for the serious, not the curious. Go now to doughyou.com to schedule your free, no obligation blueprint call. That's doughyou.com. D-O-U-G-H-U dot com. Let's go! So, Fran Harris, what's up? What's up? Listen, that introduction, I'm, I'm telling you, I need to hire you as my hype woman. That Nobody has ever introduced me with such passion and fire. And I was like, you know, let's go. I love you. Let's go. So, Good to see you again, Barbara. Good to see you. And I'm all in for being <laughs> Let me tell you, I am so serious about that, friend. So stop playing. Stop playing with me. So glad to see oh, you again. Uh, great to see you. I have to ask you real quickly before we get started. What's the H for, honey? What's the H? What's the H for in the Barbara and your, your, your brand? Well, what happened, what happened is my, my, real, my full name is Barbara Ann Holmes Smith. Right? Uh, How many Barbaras do you know? Yeah, yeah. How many Barbara Anns do you know? A lot, yeah. 
And so what, ha what happened to me is I ended up having my dental records mixed up. My mm -hmm. IRS records got mixed up. And so I said, I got to do something about this. And so people want us to put a hyphen in there. It's not a hyphen. It's just homes because I need something in the middle. <laughs> so that's the age. That's the age. Nice. The nice. You can play with that hunger, hustle. I mean, you can play with that. <laughs> play with that. Just saying. So, yeah. so I want to I want to give a shout out to one of my students, former students, James B. Snipes the third is out there. So proud of you too. My God, that, that, thank you for being out there. Listen, Fran, yes. I know you've got lots of stuff going on. So tell her audience, what are you working on right now? Some huge, huge projects. So if you were, if you're a fan of Shark Tank, you may have seen me on Shark Tank in January. And then my episode ran again in March. I just launched a new better for you functional hydration drink company called Electra. And it is all about putting something better in your body than what's in the sports drinks category. We all know who the Titans are in that category. We're not going to give them any pub on Barbara H. Smith's show, but y'all know who the big, the big guns are in the sports drink category. So we've just created something that's less sugar, fewer calories, much more stuff that's good for you putting into your body, vitamins, amino acids, antioxidants, less sugar, you know, six or seven grams of sugar compared to 35 very proud of that, and that's what I'm working on. That's one of the big projects that I'm working on right now is my Electra company. I can't hear you. I don't know. I'm sure it's great what you're saying, but I couldn't hear you. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you said that. I don't know. This is Liddy Lemonade, and yeah. it is really tasty. It is not, it doesn't have sugar, but it is tasty. It, it doesn't, Gatorade. Those people. I like <laughs> exactly. I can't drink it. I just can't yeah. drink it. Plus, it raises your blood pressure, right? Yep. Blood sugar, too. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of sugar. And they haven't changed the formula in how many years, Ryan? 50 plus years. That's when sports drinks really came onto the scene. And Gatorade obviously was the leader in that. Thank you very much for doing a lot of research and giving us the opportunity to see that there is an opportunity for something better and different. But yeah, 50 years, y'all. If you think about that, 50 years and not a lot of innovation, a lot of great commercials, but not a lot of innovation in the sports drink category over the last 50 or so years. And that and that's and that's amazing that you jumped into the market and you are doing well. And tell, we just found out that you are on in a retail store, right? Yeah. So we started after Shark Tank. We were DTC, direct to consumer, and really wanted to just get some data. That's what you need when you start a new company. You need data. You need proof that people also thought it was a good idea, not just your mother and your cousins. So we got a little bit of data and attracted a retailer, the largest retailer in Texas, which is called HEB. We will launch in mid-May in 173 HEB stores. That's over half of their stores in Texas. So a large footprint all over the state. We're very excited about it. It gives me the opportunity potentially to hire, you know, give some folks some jobs ultimately within the last half of this year. And just to create a company where, again, we're competing against the Titans, multi-billion dollar marketing budgets. And already we're starting to see that we have the opportunity to cut into some of that market share. And that is amazing that you are doing that. And, and tell us about your experience when you went against the sharks. <laughs> so got a shark tank. Knew, you know, when you go, when you pitch anybody, it doesn't matter who the VCs are, who the investors are, your friends, family, whatever. You always need to be prepared for the things that they're going to say to you that might not be so flattering, that might not might fly in the face of what you thought you were going to hear from those investors. And that's good. You want people to tell you what could possibly go wrong. Overall, the experience was absolutely amazing. Um, because I walked out of there with the deal. But the great part of that was that I got to hear a lot of objections. Mr. Wonderful was like, why in the world would you go into a sports category, sports street category and get crushed by the behemoths in the category? You will never make it. And I just had fun with it. You know, I was like, listen, I've already thought of that. Here's what we're doing about the bottles. He was like, why would you ship bottles? Bottles are so expensive. Again, you can't be rattled by the naysayers out there. You can't be rattled by the folks who don't think that what you're doing, your great idea is going to work. But honestly, overall, it was so much fun. And I always tell people, if you get on Shark Tank, you, you've you already won. I mean, honestly, not eight to nine million viewers every show. Wow. You've already won. So wow. as long as you know what to do with that exposure, you can make it work for you, even if you don't get a deal. That's, that's so awesome. I know that you're working on some real estate ventures. Let's talk about that some. 
Yeah, real, real wealth. You know, we don't historically we haven't talked a whole lot about wealth building in our, you know, in our families and our cultures or whatever. We know that in each of our families, we've probably had people who've had their land stolen. But when I started to really realize the power of having earth, having ground to build something on, which I was in my thirties when I did my first real estate transaction, I started to really get a sense for what it meant not to just, you know, renting is fine, but make sure you own something as well. Make sure you can put a pitchfork in the ground and say, this is mine because that's where the wealth really, really starts. But anyway, my brother, my oldest brother, Alonzo, has been in the real estate game for 40 plus years. He's always been doing deals, flipping, wholesaling, whatever. He, we're doing a lot of commercial stuff now. We decided to joint venture, get into business together about four years ago to start building sports facilities, right? So we started doing the research about, you guys have probably seen these youth, like Boo Williams over there in Virginia, these big conglomerates that have volleyball courts and basketball courts and those kinds of things. So we started looking at that near our hometown of Dallas and have gotten to the point where now we're about to develop two or three of those. And one of the things I was saying to you, Barbara, earlier was we typically, meaning black folks, typically are on the back end of these kinds of developments. So we come in after it's been built, you know, and spend all of our money in there, send our kids to play in tournaments every weekend for three hundred dollars, buying sneakers and all this stuff. But we're not typically owners of those kinds of things. And so I'm on a mission to Thank make you. <laughs> I'm on a mission to make sure we are not only at the table at the meeting, but that we're eating from that buffet of real estate. And so we're doing, you know, some crowdfunding and we're looking for investors all over the country who want to be owners in sports facilities, not just patrons and consumers in sports facility. And here's the one thing I want to say, get in where you fit in. It doesn't, you don't have to put a million bucks on the table. Think about this. If you put in, let me just give you a number, you know, 10 grand here and then five grand there and then 20 grand there, but you're part owner of four or five or 10 or 20 sports facilities, you are building wealth, right? You didn't have to, you don't have to own all of it because you probably heard the famous thing. It's better to have a little bit of of a, a watermelon than everything, all, all of a grape, right? And sometimes we have to get out of the mindset of, well, I don't really own that. Listen, if you got 1% of a hundred million dollar company or hundred million million dollar facility, you're doing something. If you've got two percent, you know, of a twenty thousand dollar, twenty million, you're doing something. So you build wealth incrementally. It's not always just getting it and owning everything at one time. So I'm trying to get more of us at the sports facility in front, not even just sports facilities, but at the commercial real estate table. Yes. Commercial real estate is where it's at, right? And so you're doing the you're doing the the facilities. You got the electric drink going on. What <laughs> That's else? The facilities. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what else is going on in the life? Well, uh, today, it's funny you say that today, I actually, because I've got a creative, a real creative side. I've been writing, you know, been writing books, but I've also been writing novels and writing screenplays and doing documentaries. So I, today I actually cast a couple of people for a new play that I am premiering in Dallas in July. I actually did this play. I wrote this play. Oh man, what are we, 2021? At least a decade ago. I wrote the screenplay at least a decade ago. Then I went to Dallas and did it for the first time in like 2010, uh, 2010 or something like that. And, um, and then just kind of put it away. I don't want to say something about putting it away. It's really good. We sold out, but I put it away. And went on to something else. Then last year in Virginia, ironically, because I know that's where some of our viewers are, I dusted it off, cast it, and did it in Charlottesville, Virginia. Sold out within like two or three weeks. And then COVID hit. COVID hit. And so we had to shut down the, the performances and we were actually going to do a tour. But it's a it's a play. It's going to be a movie actually about a gangster rapper who on the eve of his biggest audition finds out that he can't curse. Because his daughter prayed and asked God to remove those words from his arsenal. So it is hilarious. And it's, you know, the message is on point because it makes us as people who love rap music or who love illicit lyrics or whatever, we like the beat, but we sometimes we know the words aren't really what they should be. Well, we got a nine year old in this play and ultimately movie who's saying, um, Daddy. Are you really saying this? Are you talking to me when you're singing these lyrics? So I can't wait for you guys to see it. It's going to be amazing. So when you're doing this play, this play is, is it going to premiere in Virginia first? Is that it's going to, where it's going to premiere in Dallas in July? 
Yeah. Okay. In July. And then off we go. You know, I think we'll, the country will open up a little bit. I actually spoke to someone in exchange emails today with someone in Louisa, which is near Charlottesville today, because we were going to do it there last spring and then the country shut down. So we're already starting to pick up Atlanta. We have about six or seven cities already on the on the schedule, on the tour. So the, the actors in the tour, are they going traveling around or are you picking up people as you go along? Great question. And the reason that's a great question, because I loved my Virginia cast. And then when I had to when I came to Texas, when the pandemic hit, then I was like, well, maybe I just need to cast me some Texas folks. So then uh, now I'm casting the Texas folks. But I think I'm going to do a little mix and match. Right. Because I'll have a couple of people in different places. And that way I can say, hey, my Dallas person can't do this for Dallas. Let me fly this person over here. Or if we go to, you know, D.C., then let me bring some people from the Virginia cast or maybe even the Texas cast to do that. So I think it's going to be a, a little mix and match along the way. That is amazing. Uh, you mentioned earlier, like sports facilities in different states. And you, you talked about Virginia's Boo Williams Center. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not lying. Boo Williams is my husband's cousin, first cousin. Come on, man. So I'm not lying. I just want you to know, right? So, um, yeah, so, we, so we, we didn't think about owning any piece of that. But yeah. that's what, you, what you're saying, friend, is so vital for our community to understand, not just to hear, yeah. to understand that in order for us to leave a legacy of wealth behind, we're not going to be here forever. That's our right. parents had land. Yes, they did. And it was taken from them in many instances. Yep. And now we are just understanding what the value of have owning land is. And we're trying, some of us are trying to cap recapture that, right? Yep. Yep. So so tell us about, I want you to give us a little something, something about dough for what you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so it's interesting because I came up with that moniker probably eight or nine years ago and just said, I'm going I'm to buy some domains on that because I like, because what I'm doing is actually teaching people. And, but everybody was saying, teaching people how to monetize their expertise. And I said, hmm, well, what am I doing that's different? Or how can I position it so that it's different? And I said, I know, you know, we're making dough for which I'm making, helping people make dough for what they know. And so I thought about that eight or nine years ago because when I started to see, was that people were speaking and training and coaching and consulting and teaching and online courses and those kinds of things. But they really didn't know how to fully exploit all of their expertise so that they could build more than just a five figure business, that they could really look at everything they knew, their experiences, their expertise, their know how, their talents, their skills. If you look at that whole bundle of who you are, Everybody watching us right now is sitting on at least a million dollar brand, every single person. But the reality is that most people will never realize that as in realize as in actualize that because they don't necessarily value their experiences, their expertise, their know how all the things that have happened to them. And so I teach courses and I teach masterminds and events. I could do live events where people come in for a weekend and actually leave with their multi-million dollar plan to exploit their brand. So whether that's something that happened to you, I'll give you an example because I don't want to keep it general. For instance, let's say I've said to people many times, you know, one of the, if I made a list of all the things that ha have happened to me in my life, one of the things that stands out is the fact that I lost my mother at age 16. If I wanted to, if I just wanted to do a one whole exploitation of grief, if I wanted to do mothers who've lost their, uh, you know, daughters who've lost, lost their mothers, sons who've lost their fathers, people who've lost their parents. If I just wanted to, to exploit the term and the, the field of grief, I could build a multimillion dollar company probably in six months just on grief alone. So when you when you're listening to me now, let's take my basketball career. If I just wanted to do something just for basketball, forget my television career, forget my my real estate, forget all that. If I just use the basketball arena, pun intended, I could create a six figure, seven figure business in six months just with basketball. So one of the things I try to help people realize is that it doesn't matter what your life has been. It doesn't matter what you think you have and what you think you know or whatever. You got something that somebody needs. You got something that can transform somebody's life. It may not be based on a master's or a PhD. It could be just you know, hard knocks. 
living, just living, right? Just learning, just you know, doing life more just than anything. Life, right? Just doing life. Everybody has at least one million dollar brand or business based on nothing more than their experiences, their expertise, their know-how, their skills, and what's happened to them in life. So that's what I call making dough for what you know. So you call that making dough for what you know. I'm, I'm asking for just a little bit more insight. Like if you had one mini chapter mm -hmm. that you could explain what you teach people to do to use what they have experienced to give them dough for what they know, what would you tell them? How would you how would you introduce them? How would you take them through the process? Well, the first thing I would say, one of the things that we do is use something called my pie exercise. And so that's to take your passions, your interests, your expertise and your your experiences. Right. So literally just using the acronym pie to make a list of at least 50 things that, you know, have done or experienced. That's the first thing. Once you get that master list of what you know, what you've done or what you've experienced. Right. Any skills that you have. Then you start to delve into kind of where your heart is connected, because just because I could talk about and build a million dollar company on grief doesn't mean that I should do that, right? Just because I know how to doesn't mean that I should. So now we start to talk about alignment. Where are your, where are you most aligned? Are you most aligned with your basketball career? Are you most aligned with entrepreneurship? Are you most aligned with financial literacy or whatever? Now we're talking about aligning your heart with what, what your purpose is, right? You've got a list of 50 things, but you're not going to do all 50 of those things more than likely. You're going to probably pick five that you feel like you can really, that might be your calling, might be your divine assignment. So you go do that. And then what I tell people to do is to actually kind of put some feelers out there like you're fishing. So let's throw some of that stuff out there on your Facebook page, on your Instagram thing, on your Twitter, your TikTok or whatever. Start talking about those topics that you feel the line on, aligned on and see how people start to respond. Now, again, talk to people from a standpoint as to what your expertise means for them, not just talking about you. But like, you know what, guys, it was really tough when I lost my mother at 16. She you know, wasn't sick. She wasn't ill or anything like that. I went to Mexico. The next day she died. Has anybody else out there lost a parent? Boom. Now you, what I'm doing is fishing. I'm fishing. I put that out there. Yes, people are going to be like, oh, girl, I know what you mean. Men are going to be like, yeah, I lost my dad. Now you're starting to get some groundswell and some activity around a topic that not only you know a lot about, but that you are closely aligned with. And maybe you feel some tugging and some pulling with that. So that's kind of a short overview of some of the exercises that we do to get people from this big overview, this big list of 50 things that they could do to a smaller list of four or five things that they should do. And, and now that is so wonderful how you explained it, how you take people through the process mm -hmm. and show them sometimes they don't even know their own value. Is that right? right? And so uh, I, I have a person in my life that, that had uses this quote that says, when you don't value your value, then your value is not valuable. When you don't value your value, yeah. then your value is not valuable. Thank you, Dr. Eric Kelly III. So, so he would know that I gave him credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it is so amazing. Um, James Snipes, go ahead, go ahead and ask your question because I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the floor in a second. Um, there are so many people out here that are asking questions. James Snipes wants to know, when are you going to be back in Northern Virginia? Oh, good question. My niece, this is going to make you laugh. My niece is coming to the Boo Williams Center this weekend for a tournament. So it's funny that we were talking about that. Yeah, Journey's coming there for, and I'm not coming with the family this weekend. So it'll probably be the summer. Maybe when we bring Rappers Delight there, which may be in August or something like that, um, that I'll be back for the production of my play. So you got to let me know so that I can hype it up here on the Barbara H. Smith show that the play is coming. Rapper's Delight. I can't wait to see it. So what else? How do you, how do you, with all this stuff going on in your life, how do you get downtime? What do you do to relax? What do you do to chill out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's what I started doing on March 8th, 2020. So I was in Virginia. I came to Texas because a good teammate and friend of mine was having her, was having her um, jersey retired at our alma mater, the University of Texas at Austin, and the pandemic hit. So I came in, flew in like early bird flight on the 8th of March, and I'm from Texas, but I was working on the project in Virginia. So I just stayed here. I stayed where I had come from when the pandemic hit because nobody, I couldn't go anywhere. And so I started walking every day, like 
that Monday, the ninth or whatever it was, I started walking. And from March 8th to 2020, for the most part, I would say maybe once one day a week that I don't, I started walking every day. And at first it was just like a stress reliever because I, I used to work out. But but then it became my peace time. It became my my thought, my reflection, my prayer, my meditation time, because there was usually nobody out there. Um, and then people started. We start seeing those people that you see when you walk on trails and that kind of thing. And it's been the, the most wonderful thing because there aren't many things that I do every day. Right. People think, oh, you're an athlete. You must be extremely disciplined. I'm like, oh, all right. I mean, you know, there are things I do every day. But I started doing that every day and it changed not just the way I felt physically, but it changed where I was mentally. And so that's kind of how I unwind. And even now, right now, it's hectic. I'm learning things, you know, with Electra and retail, things that I didn't know. And sometimes it's a little stressful because I'm a woman who knows a lot of stuff. And I'm sitting here today. My brother called. He was like, what are you doing? You got 15 minutes. And I was like, no, I'm a little stressed. I'm trying to learn something that I really should know how to do, but I really don't know how to do it. So I'm really stressed. And I just got up and went for a walk and came back and it just clicked, you know. So I didn't know how much I would enjoy just chilling and walking and just not being attached to anything. But that's been the thing that's helped me the most for my mental, my mental, mental health for the last year or so. So that I want everybody to hear that, that we have to take time and we have to have that mental break. So yeah. that we refresh, we energize, right? Yep. Well, listen, I don't want you to go anywhere. We're going to be right back right after this commercial break. Don't you go anywhere. Hi, I'm Barbara A. Smith, known as the Masterful Presenter. If you could figure out a universal language, personality code, that connects with potential client, how powerful would that be? I empower people to communicate better what they do, what they have, and what they bring to the table. People love to buy. I don't need you to sell it to me. I'm going, I come in there with an intention, and that's what you're going to do going forward. You're going to go into networking events with intention. I am here benefiting from the wisdom of Barbara Smith. She gave so much information on how I can just excel in my business, and I'm taking it to a whole nother level. I'm learning a lot that I didn't really know about my business. The information that she's been presenting has been informative and helpful. To me. If you have not been in the presence of Ms. Holmes Smith, you need to make sure you do so. Her workshops are authentic, she comes with such training, and she just graces you with her presence and she allows you to feel the experience like none other before. Yeah, and we're back. So uh, we're talking today with Fran Harris. I met Fran uh, a couple of months ago, maybe a month ago, an awesome event called the Black Business Expo. And we hit it right off. And when I asked her to come on the show, she was like, yes, I'm in. When we got to be there and all of that. So I just want you to know that you are a phenomenal role model for a lot of people. And James Snipes has this question he wants to ask. I, he helps mentor lots of individuals pass the IT cybersecurity certification for free because he truly wants them to be better than he is. Should he charge for that and plan on establishing plans on establishing an LLC? Your thoughts, Fran? Is this thing on? Yes, he should. He should. <laughs> <laughs> he should. I love when people go, is this thing on? Yeah, of course it's on. Yes, he definitely should charge for that. And here's the thing, James, people who pay, pay attention. It is just the way it is. It's the way we've been conditioned and wired. And yes, do I appreciate complimentary stuff? Yes. Do I appreciate things when people give it for free? Yes. But when I pay, I pay attention. And what that means is that when people invest in themselves and when people, you know, do an exchange, there's an actual exchange of information and, and then currency. All of that's currency. My expertise is a currency. I'm going to give you the currency of my expertise and you're going to give me the currency out of your bank account. It's a fair exchange. And so it is really important that, yes, while you can have something that's free, you can kind of have that appetizer uh, motif, if you will, 
it's always important to give people the opportunity to upgrade their experience. So you absolutely should be charging for that expertise. And the interesting thing is that some people are waiting on you to charge for it. Like sometimes we think that people are just so happy, you know, to give to get this free information, but they are waiting to up level. And so you are doing a disservice to them by not offering them an extra experience, an elevated experience with you. And now what you have to do is just figure out what that elevated experience is going to be, because there are people, there are always going to be a percentage of people who have been waiting on it and are ready to invest in themselves with your experience. And that is a great point. There's a great point because listen, this guy, I want to talk to talk about him for a second. James B. Snipes III was one of those students in my information technology class who would always go above and beyond mm. until he didn't go above and beyond. He was hanging out with some friends and he didn't always do what I asked him to do. So one day I pulled him to the side. I said, listen, you are one of the smartest guys in this class. And now, James, I want you to drop your credentials in, in the chat because I want to give a shout out to you. And now he has gone above and beyond any of the wildest expectations that even he had for himself. He gives me some credit for that, but it was all him. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I do. I see the diamond inside people and break it away, break, break that, that coal away from them so that they can see the diamond in themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about what you do. That's what I love about what we do as coaches, as mentors, yeah. as teammates in this whole self-development as well as personal mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. So, James, you heard it first from Fran Harris. Get your money, baby. Get your money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we um, are we're afraid of that. You know, we're afraid of, we don't, you know, we, we don't see the value. I remember the first speaking engagement I had where I, re I started to realize that I could monetize just who I was and what I knew. I was a sophomore in college. And at the, that time, the NCAA would not allow student athletes to be paid. That's about to change this fall, thankfully. But literally, if I would go and speak somewhere, it was just like, oh, thank you so much. Come to a game. And I remember speaking, I think it was at Dell Computers with a group of CEOs or department heads. And I said, I know you couldn't, you couldn't um, pay me for what I did today because it would be a violation of NCAA rules. But if you could have paid me today to talk about championship team building and leadership, and I'm 19 years old, literally 18 or 19 years old, how much would you have paid me today? And the CEO said, hmm, about 10, 10 or 15,000. I said, 10, 15,000 what? <laughs> <laughs> so 10 or 15,000 dollars? I said, really? He said, yeah. yeah. He goes, we have people, we pay, you know, that's, they're not nearly as good as you and we pay them ten or fifteen thousand dollars, you know. And I started to realize that people literally, y'all, would pay me for my story. I had no training, you know, other than growing up in church and doing speeches and Easter and all that stuff like that. But I had no professional training. They called me to come in and talk about leadership, championship team building, culture at 18 or 19 years old, and they would have paid me ten or fifteen thousand dollars. So it's not about the degrees. That helps. I'm not going to say that it helps to stack a little more paper on your thing, but it's not about that. It's about your expertise, your knowledge, the transformation that's going to happen after you leave a place and you're speaking somewhere or you're coaching or you're training. So you have value. Other people know it. They already see it. And you can't be afraid to, to go get that money. You can't be afraid to say when someone says, so what's your fee? You can't be afraid to say twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, just, reverse it in the mirror. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sandra yep. Lucky has a question. I want you to respond to her. What would your response be for people that say, if you don't have papers, your hard knocks life is not to be taught for pay? Mm. I say uh, that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lie. Did you see the movie The Pursuit of Happiness? I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, with Will Smith, that guy was just working to get to wherever to you know just hard knocks or whatever so i think it is a misnomer that you need a degree to make an impact in the world because you don't you know some of the people that i've learned from whether it's financial literacy whether it's business literacy spiritual literacy they're not doctor you know they're not doctors they're not ordained ministers they're just people as my mother used to say who had good sense so i'm listening to the people with good sense and i'm listening to the people who make sense 
right? And so, no, I mean, you don't need you don't need degrees. You don't need letters behind your name. Those are meaning less every single day. That doesn't mean that they are worthy, you know, worth pursuing because they are. But they are. I'm not going to stop doing something or not apply for something or not enter the room because I don't have a certain credential that makes other people go, oh, wow, well, that's, you know, whatever. I'm impressed by results. I'm impressed by the results that people get. And and uh, my my buddy James Snipes also has put up what his his education is and his job. Now he's head of cybersecurity. He's the right. director. He's a director and soon to have his PhD, which just shows that you can go ahead and pursue what you want, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to stop you if you yep. don't have those credentials. Yeah. Love it. Right? I love school. Yeah, I agree. 100%. I love school. I have multiple degrees because I legit, as a millennial say, I legit love school. I love learning. So it's nothing for me to do certificates or whatever. That's how I grew up. It, it, education was really important to my parents. My mother dropped out of school when she was 11th grade. My dad didn't even finish high school, middle school or whatever. So education was really important to my family. And I grew up learning and loving learning. So I don't get degrees because I need degrees. I get degrees because that's what happens after the end of two years because I've loved learning so much. Oh, and I got this too. Let me tell this really quick story and that really illustrates that. The last degree I got, with, I went to business school a couple of years ago for a technology commercialization degree. And I decided when I was going into that program, Barbara, that I was not going to do it for grades. Now, when you're an athlete, you got to get a certain degree. You got to get a certain grade because you got to stay eligible. So I was like, I'm leaving that behind. I haven't been an athlete forever. So I'm not going to focus on grades at all. Do you know how hard it was to do that? Just simply because that's how we've been conditioned. So you get a test. You need to know what you made on it. Right. So for the first, you know, six or seven weeks, didn't look at anything. Didn't literally would take a test and be like, I hope I'm ass. You know, like, like, I hope that was good. I hope it was whatever. It was, whatever. It was such a, an amazing experience to just sit in a classroom and learn without having to compare, oh, what did you get? Oh, what did you get? And so I made it almost through the program, which was two years without looking at grades. And the only time I really had to look at a grade was when my professor <laughs> professor emailed me and was like, I don't think you finished this thing. I think what you, what you turned in was incomplete. If he hadn't emailed me, I would not have known that. Right. And that was the first time, I, you know, it's also like, OK, maybe I should start. <laughs> maybe I should start looking because now something technically happened and he didn't get all of my work. But it was so cool just to be in the classroom and just to be free to be a scholar in, in the sense that I, that made sense to me where I didn't have to say, well, what did you get on the test? Oh, well, I got a 90. And well, I, like that meant something anyway. So that's my whole thing. It's like keep educating yourself, keep learning. But it doesn't have to be in a college. And, and, and life learning is what we need to do and what we have to do in order to keep growing. My sister says this, if you're not growing and learning, then you're dying. Yep. So you have to be growing and learning and always refreshing your knowledge because things are happening so fast. The information, the information age has caused so much information to flow through yep. us, past us, in front of us, that we have to stay on top of things. That's one of the reasons why I actually got out of information technology. Mm. I'm, I'm going to put it out there in the universe <laughs> right here on, on the global stage that I stopped. I came, I saw, I conquered. I was over it. Mm -hmm. And I got to a place where every two years you had to recertify, recertify, recertify. Right. I was like, you know what? I'm done with y'all testing me. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it. So I started teaching because I didn't have to really refresh everything every, every mm -hmm. two years. But yeah, but we have to continue to learn. I got some questions out here. Sandra Lucky, she right. wants to know if you had to pick to do one thing over in your life, Ooh. what would that be? Okay. So, so that's, that was kind of easy. This came to me. So I was the last person cut, meaning, you know, didn't make the, um, the 1988 Olympic team. And it was a complete political move. You know, it was unfair. I was ticked off. I was bitter. <laughs> it was all the stuff like when you know you are supposed to get something, something is supposed to be yours. And then because of politics, you don't get it. So I retired from basketball at age 23. So I played a year in Italy, came back, tried out for the Olympic team, was the last, last athlete 
cut. So I was an alternate on the Olympic team and I quit basketball. I broke up with basketball because I was that mad. And so I was like, done with it. It's like a relationship. I'm not, you're not breaking my heart again. I'm not doing this again or whatever. If I could go back to that 23 year old girl who had every reason to feel the way she felt, I never tell people not to feel the way they feel. I still would have felt the way I felt, but I would tell myself, it's okay. Come back. It's okay. You're, you don't have to, you're not hurting them, right? Because it felt like that. Sometimes we do things and we're like, I'm going to show you, I'm going to quit basketball. That didn't hurt nobody but me. If I had, if I could go back and redo that, I absolutely would because I was making great money overseas. It plunged me into, you know, work, like, like real work. I went to Procter and Gamble and started working. I had a great career, but I should have played. I should have kept playing and just kept playing and stacked that paper and started building my wealth. I would have started to build my wealth a decade earlier than I did. And so I would go back and do that. Absolutely would. And so that that goes into our next question by James uh, Snipes again, the third. How do you feel about building legacy? I already know the answer to this question. I'm going to let you and answer it. Legacy is everything. It is why I am doing this beverage company. Because I started to look at, I started to look, it's why I'm doing the, re, the real estate, and it's why I'm doing this beverage company. I started to look at my life and start to say, okay, what, what are the things that I've done? And what are the things that will easily, easily still be here when I'm, when I'm done? Well, the truth is, besides my real estate and now the beverage company, most of the other things were like, okay, well, people will know you're here because of these things, but they won't really, really, really know you're here until you build something build something. And for me, it was really important to something, something tangible, something that if it didn't have my name on it, it still came through me. Right. And so for me, that was really, really important. And I I got to that point about maybe 15 years ago where I was like, yeah, this is great. You made a lot of money. You built well through these things. You've, You've personally invested in real estate and now you have a nice little nest egg, but have you brought the people along? Have you truly put people at the table and and gotten them eating from the buffet. And for me, that's where the game started to change. When I started going into our communities and saying, hey, this is what I'm building. Come on, be a part of this. Be a part of this. Not just my family, but my family. You know, come be a part of this. Everybody's not going to come along for the ride. But that invitation really started to change the, uh, the vibration of things that happened for me. When I started to say, let's open this up to the greater community your bigger family and start invite, inviting some of these people to the table. Same thing with Electra. So we, we solicit, you know, investors for Electra. I'm always talking to people like, would you like to be, you know, at the table and be eating with me? Then let's do it. So that would be my, that would be my thing in terms of legacy. Now I have a couple of things that whenever I decide to make my transition, then you will still know that I'm here. There is a witness that I was here. That, and that is a beautiful thing. And as we, as a community, start to do more of that, the $1 trillion that's in our community right now will begin mm-hmm. to stay in our community, yeah. which is what we've, we have allowed to leave the community because we're such consumers instead of investors. And we've got to change that trajectory for our legacy. Yeah. Black Business Expo USA is asking the question, Fran, you created a Black Business University. What is it and why did you create it? So it's been a lot of things over the last 10 years, right? Because this is, if you haven't seen a, like a, a, a pattern with me, like I will think of a grand idea and I'm like, I gotta do it, right? I, I don't need to say, oh, this gotta be this, it's gotta be that. I like, just plant the seed, plant the seed and then we'll see what it turns into. So Black Business University has been a lot of things. It was like an educational portal for a few years. And now what I'm feeling that it is, is what I wanna do is build the largest, largest marketplace of black expertise, black genius. And so that means that I'm inviting every black person who knows it. It's my dope for what you know. University really is like every black person, African, you know, diaspora, whatever, what, however you identify as black and brown, put your course, put your keynote, put your whatever, whatever in this marketplace so that when people are looking for black genius, when they're looking for black experts, Right now, if you think about that, if I if I'm a member of the media and I go, um, black experts, is there really a place that's been vetted, a place that has all of the people who are 
experts in astronomy, experts in theology, experts in beverage. It doesn't exist. So I'm inviting people to put their speeches, courses, talks, fireside chats into this one universe called Black Business University. And so we will relaunch that as a back to school in August. So I invite you in and you can do it for free. You can put your information in there for free. I'm putting my information in there. <laughs> You're going to have to give us the information when it comes out. I will definitely put it up for the for all these folks on the Barbara H. Smith show and Black Business Expo as well, because I'm also a part of their group yep. and a part of that magnificent uh, organization that's going to showcase Black businesses across the world. So we were glad to have you on the Black Business Expo last year, this year. It seems like last year already. Last year, yeah. A couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And it's coming up again in June, from June 7th to the 13th. And we'd love to have you on there again. Great. So um, James Stipe says, sign me up. Great. I think it was Sherry Bootstrap Black Hunt said, thank you for your transparency. That's so cool. Thank and you. I had another comment earlier. Sandra Lucky said, was it love and basketball? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Yeah, it was kind of that way. It was kind of that way. I was like, I'm done with you. You you will not break my heart again. I'm done with you. But of course, you guys know that I came back and played in the WNBA. So it all worked out. I fell in love again, played on the WNBA's first championship team in 1997. So I took seven and a half, eight years off from basketball before I allowed myself to uh, to fall in love again. And it was it was well worth it. And you you are and still were and still are a champion and mm -hmm. a championship player in life and in love mm -hmm. with with people. Tell us some more about your time in the WNBA. Wow. Well, I mean, this is the funny thing about taking off all those years after I decided I was going to break up with basketball. When I came back, when I got ready to come back because the WNBA announced that they were launching you know, a real league. I remember calling, reaching out to the WNBA and because I hadn't played, remember, so I quit basketball one Olympic summer and never played again. So typically you play on the next USA national team. And so your name stays very relevant and whatever. So nobody knew what I was doing. They knew I was doing ESP. By this time I was on ESPN on television as an announcer, but in terms of playing basketball, nobody had seen me on a court since 1998. So when the WNBA started, I reached out to the WNBA and I was like, hey, yes, I'm looking for, you know, what's, what's happening with the league? And they were like, yeah, we remember you, but um, what is your interest? So I, <laughs> I hadn't played in so long. They were like, do you want to coach? What are you trying to own a team? What are you doing? And I was like, no, no, I'm interested in playing. They were like, OK, OK, whatever. That, they didn't say that, but that was the tone of it was like, you haven't played in eight years. You're trying to tell me you're going to try to play. So I went to try out and it was, I, I will never forget that it was Mother's Day, 1997 in Houston and went there. There were 250 women trying out for two spots, two, right? A lot of these women had just gotten out of college. So they're like infants. They're 24 years old. They're like, whatever. But what you know, y'all know this when you were, when you were an OG and I was 30, 30, 31 at the time. Um, you know the tricks of the trade. I wasn't 25, but I know the tricks of the trade. I know what coaches look for. So long story short, 250 women were there on Friday night. By Sunday, there were only two standing, and I was one of them. So I landed the spot. I beat out over 250 young women to land the spot on a team that eventually won the WNBA's first championship. So I felt very fortunate and blessed in that situation, especially for a girl who broke up with basketball. Who was like you? You know what you're not gonna do? You ain't breaking break my heart. You ain't breaking my heart again. So the fact that I got over that, healed myself, and went back to the game that I loved and I was able to win a championship was was absolutely magical. That was sweet revenge, wasn't it? It was. It was very nice. And everybody who was like, well, who when I called them, it was like. Um, what, what is your interest? I was like, you remember when I called? Because I'm that girl. I'll be like, uh -uh, just so you know, remember when I called you? I'm, like, I'm that girl. <laughs> remember when I called you and you tried to act like you didn't know who I was? You tried to act like, yeah, it's me. Bam, there's a ring. That's that's kind of how it was about that that summer. Sandra Lucky said they didn't know whose skills they were trying to sleep on. <laughs> exactly. Don't sleep on my skills. Don't sleep on my skills. Exactly. It was great. That is um, that is amazing work you've done over the years with with your career and your life and how you've encouraged 
so many people along the way. I like most of all that not only are you leaving a legacy, but you're asking and inviting our community to come to the table. How amazing would it be if we got everybody on that same plane and that same bus? Yep. I do see a lot of people who, and we know, we all know people who are getting getting theirs and then telling other people about it after they got theirs, <laughs> right? After they've eaten, they're like, oh, you, you, know, you didn't know I was feasting over here. And I, what made me really realize that was probably, I don't know if it was like eight or nine years ago, I was teaching something online and one of my cousins, uh, one of my first cousins said, no, my second cousin, I own cousins with his mom, but, um, he said, I didn't even know you were doing this. He said, why haven't you taught us this? Whoa, that was like, wow, that hit me still. That hits me really hard. It hurts. It did. <laughs> it did. He was like, and it was on like Facebook or something. He was like, friend, I didn't even know you. Why haven't you taught us this? I was like, whoa. And that changed that 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 took me that leveled me up to another level because then I was like because we all know sometimes people say well girl don't get in don't try to get in business with your family don't try to whatever and I had to break that conditioning because I have family members that I'm very good friends with and I have family members that I'm not very close with but I had to break the conditioning of don't invite your family in because it's going to destroy your relationships and I had to realize that relationships have to be built on stronger foundation and you know, put it out there. And if people want to be a part of it, be a part of it. If they don't, whatever. And so that was kind of like the leveling up also of my transparency. Like, let me tell you this. Don't put your, don't put your baby's, you know, diaper money in this. Don't put your last. So you have to be very clear with people. Like These are decisions you're making, but let me tell you, there is risk here. There's whatever, whatever. But yeah, when my cousin said that, I was like, okay, I hear you. God, I hear you. Like, I hear you. Like I was doing stuff that nobody in my family had ever done. And yet I wasn't, my immediate little family <laughs> knew all about it and they're great and they were in it. But my, again, that next level of family, that next level of family that I could have, that I am now truly transformed and changed their lives. But because I was holding this to my immediate little, you know, people got the same mom and daddy that I have, they were getting it. But that next, that next circle and that next circle needed it as well. And it's a ripple effect. So absolutely, drop that pebble in, and you yep. wanted to have those concentric circles. Yep. We got some comments out here. Um, Showbiz sixty two says, "I have thoroughly enjoyed how the sports women have been talking about issues, whether it's yeah. coach in Arizona talking about work, being a working mother coach, mm -hmm. or player on BLM, Black Lives Matter." Yep. And that is amazing that you have that comment. It just reminded me that there was a conviction today. Yeah. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. And I was before we got hopped on, I was getting ready to post my little statement. You know, it's interesting. Once you start to accept the responsibility that your voice matters, sometimes I'll be like, eh, nobody needs to really hear what I have to say about that. And then, then that other voice says, there are people who need to hear what you have to say. And it's not for me. So what happened today, I was like, great proof. It's a good start. That's how I feel about what happened today. It's not the end all. It's not the it's not justice. It's accountability, as some people are saying right now. But it is a good start. And the thing that I always say is that bad things happen. Bad people get to continue to do bad things because good people are silent. And so if there's anything, whether that's in your relationships, you know, witnessing something in your neighborhood, bad people are counting on good people to keep their mouths closed. And so if you don't do anything else, speak up, speak up, talk up, make sure you are getting involved. Um, today was a good day, especially for, for the family of George Floyd and for the greater family of people who look like George Floyd. That is absolutely true. And I, I echo and ditto exactly what you say. It's, it's not a victory dance. Yep. It's a small pebble in a pond. We'll take it. Yep. But what has to happen is a transformation in this country that our brown black people have value. Our lives do matter. Yep. All lives matter, but until black lives matter, it's, it's a moot point. Mm -hmm. And so you heard it first right here on the Barbara H. Smith Show. We are happy for the Floyd family and we are happy for the conviction. We've got a lot of work to do, folks. Don't sleep. 
Don't sleep. It's not over yet. Yep. You know what I wish? I wish that we could be as outraged out there as we are on social media. Oh, right. we mad. We mad on Facebook. We're mad on, you know, I can't believe this moment. But when I ask you to come and vote, when I ask you to come to the million woman march, when I ask you to do, when I give you these opportunities, you got all these excuses. And I realize that some of us do get involved, but I'm just saying if we were as outraged out there as we are in here, we would change, we would change this by next year, this time next year. Well, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but it it's easier to be outraged on social media behind the camera, you hide it behind the screen, yep. behind behind the information technology. Yep. But it's harder to stand up and say that's wrong. And so people right. need to, we all need to. When you say something, you need to say something because mm -hmm. if somebody says something, then things don't change. Right. This has yep. been an amazing showbiz 62 has another comment. There is a bill after George Floyd that will radically reform police. It must yep. pass. That's a uh, that's a great thing that's happening right now. Again, we can still we still need to voice our opinions and, and not just our opinions, action speaks out of words. Show up at the poll. You don't think it matters? It matters. That is all we have for our show today. Oh, Fran Harris, I can talk to you some more, some more, some more, some more. As we say in New York, I could talk to you for some more right now. <laughs> we are going to have to get out of here in about three minutes. Do you have any last, I want you to give inf any information you want to give about anything that's going on in your life, how to get in touch with you, anything that you have as our last outtake. No, I mean, just get in touch. I'm on LinkedIn. That's a great way to do it. If you were not here at the beginning of the show, th then you didn't see the commercial for dou.com, but uh, we can put that in the chat, d-o-u-g-h.com, uh, d-o-u-g-h-u.com, where I teach you how to turn your expertise, knowledge, know-how, experiences into a multi-million dollar brand and business within a year. It is an application process, but we will get it done. And that's simply what we started talking about this story at the beginning of the show. And that was, how do you take everything you know, everything you've done, and actually create a brand and a legacy that can be here when you leave? So check out dough you, as in dough for what you know, like bread dough, doughyou.com. That is so wonderful. And if you'd like to be a guest on the Barbara H. Smith Show, you can apply at support at the bhsshow.com. That is support at the bhsshow.com. I have had a phenomenal time with our guest today, Fran Harris. She was an amazing guest. We continue to bring you enlightenment, entertainment, business, and all kinds of fun conversation right here on the Barbara H. Smith Show. Don't you miss it next week. I'm Barbara H. Smith, your coach, your mentor, your celebrity speaker, trainer. And I will see you next week. Thank you for spending time and space with me. Hey, it's Fran Harris, founder of Electra Sports Beverages. So excited that you are joining me right now for this live broadcast where I am launching finally launching my sports beverage. Now, Electra is a better for you functional beverage company that other things will come after in a few years. But right now we are launching one of the best, better for you, in fact, best for you sports drinks on the planet. Now, a lot of people will say, why would you start a beverage company when you've got other competitors, huge competitors in the marketplace in this space? Well, it's a $23 billion industry, sports drinks, $23 billion opportunity. That means there's room to play. The reality is if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. So I'm very proud of Electra, very proud of what Electra stands for. I'm very proud of this nutritional panel back here because we didn't miss a beat. We knew that consumers were looking for better taste, higher functionality, lower sugar, fewer calories. We knew that. And I am so proud of what we have put in this bottle. It's something that you can give your kids. It's something that you can drink yourself, whether you're an elite athlete or an everyday hustler. We put some great stuff in this bottle. And I want to invite you to join me on this journey for this big online launch party. There's a lot of room. There's a lot of room to play. I'm going to get in where I fit in. I'm going to find my niche and make sure that we develop and produce products that are absolutely amazing that our customers want. So I wanted to introduce you to Electra. Here, so we got three flavors. You've got Passion Punch, you got 
Oh Yeah Orange, and you got Liddy Lemonade. And so whatever your pleasure is, if you like the punch taste, if you like the orange taste, if you like the Liddy Lemonade, then you can have your pleasure, all right? But I want you to get in on this because we're doing something special with the lecture right now. We're launching it first time out of the gate. That means that you can get it right now at a very special price if you participate in my Indiegogo campaign. Now let's talk about what an Indiegogo campaign is. This is not a fundraiser. This is an opportunity to generate some buzz and some fun around the launch of a brand new product. And you get the opportunity to get things like t-shirts, um, come to some private events. It's an opportunity for you to be a part of something bigger than all of us, right? Imagine if you had been there when that other sports drink had started 50 years ago. Imagine what, what it would have felt like to be a part of what you knew was going to be history. That's what I'm offering you the opportunity to do right now is to be a part of Electra's launch to the public. Now, Electra will be available online, so you'll be able to go to our website and our store and buy Electra, but you won't be able to get access to some of the prizes that you're going to get access to by participating in this campaign. And there are many, many levels that you can get involved in. You can get involved at a very low level where you just want to be a supporter. You can get involved at a different level where you get a t-shirt and a cap. You can get involved at a different level where you can come to a VIP event with me, hang out with me and my team. Either way, get in where you fit in and just become a part of this historic launch. There should be a button on this page right now. All you need to do, click that button, and then you can learn all about the different ways that you can be involved in this particular launch campaign. All right, click the button right now. I appreciate your support so much, and I will see you on the other side.